Hello there, my fellow adventurers. Get ready for another delve into the bestiaries of Dungeons and Dragons. In this ranking, we're going to take a look at the aberrations of the Monster Manual. Now, there are some great entries in Volo's Guide and Mordenkainen's Tome, but if I were to include them, this video would end up way too long, so I'll save them for another day. So what's an aberration exactly? It's essentially a weird or an alien monster. Perhaps it's touched by the Far Realm, Perhaps it's a twisted mutant from some misbegotten corner of existence where the gods bear no influence. Or perhaps it's a spawn of one of the great old ones, the Lovecraftian elder horrors whose existence is beyond the kin of all but the most depraved scholars. I'm sure many of you watching this video are familiar with the works of H.P. Lovecraft, but for those that aren't, his stories are some of the most influential works of horror from the 1900s. His style continues to bear influence even till today. You can see it in such video games as Darkest Dungeon and Bloodborne, as well as Magic the Gathering planes like Zendikar and Innistrad. Whereas most D&D monsters have their roots in mythology, fairy tales, and medieval fantasy, aberrations take things in a different direction, and they are influenced by cosmic horror, weird fiction, and even a bit of science fiction. So pull out the bizarre tome hidden in your reclusive grandfather's study, chant the cryptic ritual written in the logograms of some forgotten race. We now approach the Mountains of Madness. As usual, F tier has a very low population. While the low ranking monsters of D&D do have their place in the fantasy world, their limitations are many. The Slotty are one of the main classic types of aberrations in D&D, and their life cycle is a strange one. They reproduce either by transforming humanoids through a disease known as Chaos Phage, or by implanting their eggs inside humanoid hosts. Looking at this latter process, a Slod egg eventually develops into a Slod tadpole, and in true xenomorph alien fashion the tadpole bursts out of the victim's body. This is pretty freaky and a unique and gruesome lore, but the slod tadpole otherwise is a very simple and basic beast. Climbing up from the muck we reach D tier. Still the grimy underbelly of a monster ranking, but we witness a bit of evolution in the specimens. Lurking within the garbage dumps of the D&D world is the... Uh, you OTF. That's it. There must be a DD pronunciation guide somewhere. By the tentacle pubes of Cthulhu, I found it. At Yug? Oh, uh, wait, this was written by a British bloke. Okay. At Yug. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Here we can already see some of the frequent traits of an aberration tentacles and odd number of appendages and eyes. The Atyug is a simple creature. It lives in slop and scum, consuming about anything, though it prefers living creatures. It has a diseased bite and effective tentacle grabs and slams, and curiously, it possesses a manner of limited telepathy that it uses to lure prey. The Monster Manual is quite vague on how exactly it employs this tactic, but I'm sure we creative DMs can think of something. This is a classic D&D monster, Fun to use now and again, but as with most monsters who have low intelligence and just want to eat everything, it's hard for them to make it into higher tiers. First off, I must say that I love this monster. It's so creepy and weird. I remember running a dungeon during the playtest phase of D&D 5e called Escape from the Scarlet Citadel. The characters were locked in a labyrinth underneath a citadel of a wizard villain, and just around the bend ahead they heard a child crying. They rounded the corner to find a quivering mass of oozing flesh that had an assortment of different mouths and continuously emitted insane gibbering. This creature is really about as good as it gets for D tier. Its style is so damn nightmarish, and its abilities are interesting, unique, and they throw a monkey wrench into the character's typical strategies. Unfortunately, the gibbering mouther has basic lore and abysmal role-playing and versatility, which hold it back from being anything more. We have now reached the mid-levels of the Aberrations ranking, which, as usual, has the highest quantity of specimens. 
The Flumph is a monster that I've long since hated on. Its appearance is so cartoonish, like something that belongs in Adventure Time or Aqua Teen Hunger Force more than D&D. Well, hi there. My name is Floaty. But as I studied the monster manual entry, I discovered that this creature actually has some really interesting abilities and lore to it. So this is basically what I call a reskin monster. In fact, it doesn't even need that much reskinning. Their entry states that they resemble floating jellyfish, and that alone works just fine. Keep in mind these reviews are not about a DM's ability to reskin or modify monsters. They're based solely on the entries as officially presented in the books. Flumps occupy an interestingly unique niche in the Underdark ecosystem. They're sensitive and moral beings, yet they feed off the psionic energy of nearby sentient creatures. So imagine a little monster that lives in your basement, consuming your random pointless thoughts and excess stress energy. As a flump has absorbed such a steady stream of mental activity, it's typically aware of the many goings-on in its local environment. Flumps also live in complex societies composed of peaceful communities, where they all contribute and pursue topics such as philosophy, religion, and mathematics. Aside from telepathic prowess, a flump has an acidic tendril attack, as well as a once per day stench spray. Otherwise, they're extremely weak creatures. So if you can get past the thing's ridiculous appearance, there's a lot of potential for the flump. The Chul. Whereas the flump represents a monster with low style and high role-playing potential, the Chul is just the opposite. These semi-sentient giant crustaceans are an ancient creature created in the primeval era by Aboleths to serve as minions and thralls who could leave the water and carry out their master's bidding, which often was to track down magic items using their innate magic sensing ability. After the Aboleths and other Elder Horrors were defeated by the gods, many Chuls were left to their own designs. Their link to Aboleths has not really died away, and daring adventurers can sometimes find Chuls still guarding the ruins of the ancient Aboleth Empire, or even serving some of the few living Aboleths. In combat, a Chul can fight just as well in water or on dry land. It is a standard brutish grappler constrictor type of monster, but with the complement of mouth tentacles that produce a paralyzing slime. The Chul gets my stamp of just plain old cool. Primordial lobster aberrations really kick ass. In an ancient time, Primus, overlord of the clockwork Nirvana of Mechanus, created an artifact of law. It was a complex geometrical stone which he launched into the ever-changing chaos of Limbo, hoping to bring order to that plane. His law satellite project ended unsuccessfully, with its result being the spawning of the Slotty. They are the living embodiments of chaos, not nearly as corrupt as demons, but still wild and with vague, highly basic motivations. Now, remember that chaos phage disease I mentioned. Well, a humanoid who dies in this way transforms into a red slot. The red slot itself does not inflict this disease. That is the territory of the blue slot. The red slot, however, has the ability to plant eggs inside the bodies of its victims that develop into slot tadpoles, then burst out of the hosts and become blue slot. So in short, red slot create blues and blue slot create reds. Whew. A red slot is mechanically somewhat similar to a troll in that it's a large brute with regeneration, uh, bite attack, and two claws. Whereas the troll is a bit more powerful and has that weakness to fire and acid, the red slot resists elemental damage and has magic resistance, though not quite as strong in its hits. Easily the coolest thing about the red slot is that ability to implant the egg inside of a host. Roughly shoulder to shoulder with it is the blue slot, which again is a kind of troll-like brute, though a little bit more powerful. The blue slot's claim to fame is that chaos phage disease I've already referenced, which it inflicts with its claws. Like the red slot, this monster has abysmal role-playing opportunities, and their only motivation really is just to propagate their species. The Grell is another one of the monsters that I stumbled upon early on my path as a D&D gamer. It's 
weird and freaky style really affected me back then, and it stayed with me throughout all these years. In fact, the Grell is already featured in two videos of mine, Top 10 D&D Monsters 5th uh, Edition and when I attempted D&D Monster Languages. This monster is a floating brain with a beak mouth and 10 long tendrils that end with barbs which secrete a paralyzing poison. It is a stealth ambusher who prefers to let adventurers get tangled up with more brutish underdark denizens, then it slinks down to seize its prey and pull it away into isolation and eat it. A final interesting note is that Grells can absorb lightning, and their lore states that they have an innate ability to manipulate electricity. I would very much love to see a Grell variant that can actually make some kind of lightning attack on its own. At the top of C tier, and at the top of cavern ceilings, is the Cloaker. This creature does have a pretty basic lore and very little versatility in its ways. While it is an intelligent species that speaks both deep speech and undercommon, it has a simplistic, isolationist, and primitive kind of way. This is somewhat baffling, as the entry to a typical Cloaker gives it Intelligence 13, Wisdom 12, and Charisma 14. Why don't they have a more complex society with advanced technology? At least something comparable to human-level development would make sense. Though, of course, with a very different sort of infrastructure. Though the monster manual does not state any reason, I suppose we'll just have to assume that they have some manner of severe drawback due to their aberration essence. Aside from these low points, a cloaker is a very cool and interesting monster. They lurk camouflaged within caves, fly around like airborne manta rays, emit frightening moans, and use defensive illusions similar to mirror image. Their tails can slash foes, and their bite attack causes them to latch onto their targets, possibly even blinding and suffocating them. While attached, a cloaker transfers half of all damage it takes onto the prey. Just reading the cloaker's entry makes me want to design an encounter, write some lore to add depth to their ecology. We have now broken into the upper tiers, my bold comrades. What mind-bending terrors shall we behold here? The Green Slot is the first of the four B-tier aberrations from the Monster Manual. You'll recall the Red Slot creating Blue Slotty by implanting eggs in host bodies, and then the Blue Slot creating Red Slotty by infecting victims with Chaos Phage. Well, in the case that either one of them transforms a spellcaster who wields third level or higher spells, the result is actually a green slot. It has the troll-like base of the red or the blue, but without the egg implant or the chaos phage. It knows a few spells, including detect magic, detect thoughts, fear, invisibility, and fireball. It can also hurl flame at will and polymorph itself into humanoid forms. Not only does this provide it with more varied combat options, but also a chance for trickery and prevalence in the role-playing interaction type scenes. The only weird hiccup is that it only speaks slod and has telepathy. I'm imagining a green slod changing into the form of a humanoid in order to employ some trickery, but it cannot speak or understand anything that anyone is saying. Would it really have been that big of a stretch to simply give it common? A green slod's personal quest in life is to unlock the magic secret of becoming a gray slod. What is this great secret, you ask? Well, you'll have to craft it yourself because the monster manual is vague on this subject. However, once a green slot morphs into a gray slot, its magical prowess increases, gaining additional spells, including such super hits as Major Image, Fly, and Plane Shift. It also gets the spell Tongues, so it can somewhat make better use of its shape-changing trick. But it's still weird, because even with Tongues active, it will still be speaking slod, except other creatures will be able to understand it. Just give the damn monster the common language already! As well, the Grey Slod unlocks the mysterious and esoteric art of wielding the Great Sword. Weirdly, its natural attacks are actually weaker than those of the lower Slotty. Wait a sec. The Grey Slod is medium size. It shrank? Hmm. Although the Grey Slod's alignment still says Chaotic Neutral in the Monster Manual, I seriously question that, as Grey Slotty served Death Slotty, 
which are chaotic evil and quite nasty things, really. So here we have a monster that serves an evil master, travels to other planes in order to do said evil master's bidding, and whose ultimate goal is to eat one of these evil death slots in order to transform into a death slot itself. But no, it's not evil. It's just uh, heading there. Ugh. Here we are now at the epitome of Sloddom, the wicked death slot. They are corrupted by the influence of the negative plane, which is not a nice place and possibly the most boring plane in all of D&D because there's almost nothing going on there and you basically cannot adventure there. Personally, I wish the death slot would have been a sort of variant slot, not their highest ranking leader. Slotty are creatures born out of the chaotic neutral plane of Limbo, and their head chiefs should therefore also be chaotic neutral. Aside from some wackiness there in its lore, the Death Slot is an interesting monster to run overall due to its mechanics and options in combat. It is, however, fairly generic in that it's virtually identical to all the other Slotty. It's just a notch stronger than the Grey Slot and it has the addition of Cloud Kill, and it can use Plane Shift on other creatures, which, that's interesting. Oh, and it doesn't resist necrotic damage. That's right, the Death Slot, with negative energy plane influence, has no resistance to necrotic. A final point of interest about the Slotty is their control gems. Whenever a slot emerges from the spawning stone, it implants a tiny shard of itself inside the slot's head. If another creature can successfully remove the gem, either through magic means or sort of brain surgery, that creature can henceforth control the slot. I do think this adds an interesting layer of depth to the slotty, and I would like to see this in play, either with an NPC villain controlling slotty, or a player character removing a control gem, subjugating a slot and perhaps later an interdimensional bounty hunter from Mechanis comes tracking down the character. I have been more than fair with the slotty, giving them as generous of ratings as possible. I have to say overall I am disappointed with them. They need another round of solid revisions and some better lore. More than that, they need freaking variety. These are supposed to be the manifestations of the Plane of Chaos, yet they're all virtually identical to each other. I get that they represent a sort of progression of life cycle, but even devils, who are totally opposite on the lawful end of the spectrum, transform into very different forms and abilities whenever they rise up in rank. Moving along, solidly in mid-B tier, we come across the Intellect Devourer, one of those highly unique monsters in D&D, along with others like Rust Monsters and Shadows and ochre jellies that do other kinds of damage besides pure hit point reduction. I do think the Intellect Devourer needs a bit of a reskin, as its current form is kind of cartoonish or silly, but much like what we saw with the Flump, if you can get past the somewhat goofy look, you will find a very interesting monster. The short version is that Illithids create Intellect Devourers from the brains of their thralls. These extracted brains turned into monsters then hunt the Underdark, hungry to consume the intelligence and memories of prey. Once doing so, the Intellect Devourer then inhabits the victim's body, using it like a puppet. The potential for storytelling and fantastic antics is just superb. Now this monster is only challenge rating 2, but if it can somehow get the jump on a low intelligence character, its Devour Intellect ability could still cause quite an impact at about any level. I have to give a big nod of appreciation to this little bugger for being so unique, so weird, and really it's sure to cause a big reaction in the players whenever they see it. With an improvement in its style, the Intellect Devourer could probably reach into low A tier. Here we are my friends, we have reached the mother brain of aberrant kind the vortex of madness, the great unknowable expanse that lies beyond all time and space. At last we come to the mighty Beholder, one of the king monsters of Dungeons and Dragons, exemplifying so much of the game itself. They are frightening and strange. This represents dungeons, which are dark, 
creepy and altogether unlike the familiar cities of the mortal races. They're powerful. This represents the game mechanics, which provide extraordinary powers for adventurers, villains, and monsters to clash in battles that the average person would never experience. They have variety. This represents the game options, which feature many types of different races, classes, abilities, items, and spells. They have role-playing. This represents the type of game, RPG, as beholders are either eccentric soloists or masterminds involved in plots. They have tactics, and this represents the tactical style of D&D, as the characters navigate various types of perils during the adventures. And they have randomness. This represents the dice rolls, the element of random results in D&D. Beholder's eye rays activate by random selection, and they have a variety of different effects. So much is contained within one monster. It is a total home run. I do want to touch upon two more points here, though. First is the wondrous potential of a Beholder's layer. Of course, it is possible to encounter Beholder outside of its own layer, but most often it will be at its home going about its bizarre lifestyle. Think of a big network of tunnels and especially vertical shafts with access to others. A beholder does not live in a layer designed for humans, but for itself, a floating, magic eye ray slinging monster. The layer terrain should be challenging, if not outright punishing for the characters, and slaying a beholder should be no easy task. Of all the cool bits developed for 5th edition, Layer actions are one of those special details that I really treasure. My second point is actually a nitpick against the Beholder. That's right. Now, it still is one of my very favorite monsters, if not my number one favorite of all time. But as I was studying the Beholder, I realized that their lore is actually not as good as it could be. They do have some interesting dynamics when it comes to their problems with other Beholders and how every once in a while one of them becomes an eye tyrant. But honestly, the Monster Manual really lacks much depth as to the Beholder's backstory. Where did they come from? Who are they really? Of course, there are other supplements from other editions that get into this or have other speculations, but this video series really focuses on 5th edition and what is actually presented in the books. In that regard, giving the Beholder a score of 3 in lore is as generous as I can possibly be. And on that note, we come across the Spectator, one of the lesser Beholder kin. Of course, it's not quite as impressive or terrifying as a standard Beholder, but it makes up for this in the role-playing and lore attributes. Instead of being a lawful evil, ultra-egotistical, xenomorphic hermit, a Spectator is a lawful neutral guardian bound in service to a spellcaster by way of a particular contract. The summoner most often binds the spectator as a sentinel or watch guard for a layer. But spectators also are conversationalists, and we can easily imagine the summoner having a long-winded discussion with this strange being. It would also converse with guests, whether they were welcome or unwelcome ones. Yes, I understand completely that you are philosophically opposed to the current methodology employed by my master, but we cannot discount the fact that he is a dedicated and capable scholar whose contributions to the arcane pursuits are worthy of high praise. It was a noteworthy highlight of my day holding this thought-provoking exchange with you all, though I must remind you that should you cross the threshold of my master's abode, I shall have no choice but to assail you with the full force of the powers at my disposal. Now, if you will be decent enough as to remove yourselves from the premise forthwith, I should very much like to take my lunch now. Then the spectator conjures a meal of squid frogs, which it hungrily lassos with its long tongue. That's right, spectators can magically create their own food. A spectator has only four eye stalks instead of ten, and these include confusion, fear, paralysis, and wounding. Its central eye is not a cone of anti-magic, but rather a source of spell reflection, sending back magical assaults to other targets, which is a rare and just downright badass ability. So while nothing can take away the awesomeness of the classic Beholder, I must admit that the spectator 
does have an edge with its built-in storytelling and role-playing potential. One of the most iconic aberrations in D&D history is the Mind Flayer, aka the Illithid. They are memorable and striking in appearance, with clear influence from Cthulhu and other Lovecraftian stylings, and their lore is some of the richest and deepest of any monster. I could make an entire video devoted entirely to Mind Flayers. They are evil overlords, psionic masters, mad scientists, and interdimensional voyagers, with all manner of plots, schemes, and experiments. When you think of the top-tier races that run the show in the Underdark, you think of Drow and Mind Flayers. But Mind Flayers travel far and wide as well, most notoriously enslaving the Gith race in the Astral Sea long ago. There are several other creatures and whole races who have been affected by the Mind Flayers, if not outright created by them. Quotoa, Rimlocks, and Intellect Devourers, just to name a few. Mind Flayers typically live in colonies, each settlement centered around an Elder Brain, which is a massive brain monster that lives in a vat of fluid and gives psychic commands to its retainers. And with all this brain talk, we must also remember that a Mind Flayer's diet consists of brains. Succulent. A typical Mind Flayer has the psionic abilities of detect thoughts, levitate, dominate monster, and plane shift, as well as powerful mind blasts that deal psychic damage and render the target stunned. The other classic Mind Flayer attack is its mouth tentacles, which grab and incapacitate targets, then extract their brains. Along with all of this comes the Mind Flayer's variety of saving throws, skill proficiencies, and magic resistance. Its weak spot is about what you'd imagine, low hit points and low physical stats, much like a wizard, but it will usually mitigate this with some brutish thralls. What a monster. Taking things up a slight notch higher is the Mind Flayer Arcanist. As a Mind Flayer, it encompasses everything we've already seen about their race, and it has an additional layer in the fact that it pursues the arcane arts. If we consider the implications of this, things get interesting. Mind Flayers utilize psionic power, the mind magic innate in them or bestowed upon them by their elder brain overlords. In this way, arcane and other types of magic are actually taboo in their society. Wizards, sorcerers, clerics, druids, these are the ways of the other lesser races, the enemies and the infidels. However, Every so often a Mind Flayer is tempted by the pursuit of the arcane arts, and it studies this field in secret. An Illithid Arcanist is always living dangerously, but the consequences of being discovered are dire. And secrets are difficult to maintain in a community of psionicists connected to a central brain. For this reason, Mind Flayer Arcanists often leave their home settlements, going rogue or perhaps joining with a small conclave of like-minded individuals. Taking this compelling lore into account, along with the Mind Flayer Arcanist complement of wizard spells up to 5th level, we find a monster that has even a bit more to offer on top of the typical Mind Flayer, which is already a stellar monster. At the top of this ranking, we find the great granddaddy of all aberrations, the Aboleth. Other than the great old ones themselves, no other aberrant creature has the claim that the Aboleth does. They are slimy aquatic masterminds who dwelt within the seas and underground lakes during the primordial era, before the mortal races were born, before even the gods had appeared. The original empire of the world was that of the Aboleths, and they subjugated many other primeval beings, either enslaving or mutating their subjects to their wills. The gods eventually came and brought down the Aboleth Empire, wiping away all traces except those tucked far away in the most hidden nooks. Those few who survived persisted as they could, and the later generations they spawned carried with them these ancient, ancient memories, for an Aboleth remembers all that its ancestors knew. The Aboleth has an array of abilities. It can mentally dominate other creatures, as well as transform them into slimy, water-breathing mutants. They can attack with their tentacles and their tails, 
They have a psychic drain ability that draws mental vigor from enslaved creatures. Their senses are keen, and they also sport telepathy. And as well, as with most big boss monsters, they have both legendary actions and layer actions. My personal favorite being the grasping tides that pull creatures into the water. Unfortunately, the Aboleth does not have legendary resistance. It's also somewhat vulnerable out of water as it's a sluggish creature there. Speaking of creating monsters, every month I'm creating new 5th edition monsters and NPCs, complete with stat blocks, art, and lore, and I draw upon my patrons for the concepts. If you'd like to get access and go into the selection pool, just follow the link down in the video description and check out the tier called Lore Keeper. If you can't join at this time, no worries. I have a free newsletter and a Discord server. The links are also in the video description. Of the many categories of monsters in D&D, the aberrations are certainly the most different. They break out of the typical molds built by the fantasy genre and encompass a space that feels both futuristic and older than old. They are the mad whisperers who existed before mythology and will be there again one day once we reach the ultimate heights of our technological advancements. As Lovecraft put it, they are shadows out of time. If you'd like to see part two for aberrations or some other type of monster ranking, leave a comment and let me know, and don't forget to subscribe. May your wisdom saving throws against madness be strong, and may your adventures be many.